Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Startup Jungle. Uh, I'm your host, Lo Silva, along with uh, Sweeney. And today we have uh, kind of an OG in growth hacking. Uh. <laughs> Started the first growth hacking agency, uh, also one month, uh, which is a program on how to learn Ruby in 30 days, which is kind of crazy. Uh, yeah. And uh, in New York, we have uh, Matan Griffin. What's up, man? How are you? Hello, everybody. I'm good. Good, good. So, uh, Matan, I, I want uh, kind of I wanted to start off with just seeing exactly how did you get into startups and how how did how did you end up essentially where you are now? Uh, give us a little bit of a backstory. Yeah, I ended up doing startups because um, I couldn't find a job doing anything else. <laughs> I I studied philosophy and finance and. Uh, and the two of those things didn't really lend themselves to, you know, getting a job in finance, especially in 2010 when things weren't doing so well. So uh, I was, I mean, I was pretty just strapped. I, I remember applying for over a hundred jobs and I didn't get one. And um, and and then somebody recommended a startup. I didn't even know what a startup was at the time. All that I knew was they were like a group of 20-year-olds who liked to drink a lot. Were all really attractive. <laughs> um, they had like a keg in the office on Friday. They seemed like a lot of fun, and from that moment on, I, I was like, "Yeah, I really want to work here." Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, it's 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 funny how many people with uh, you know big college degrees don't do anything relating to you know their degrees. It's 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 tough out there. You know what I totally, mean? Totally, totally. Um, it's it's hard to do stuff related to philosophy, also. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um. After after your first startup, where did you uh, where did you kind of how did the whole sequence go? Did you did you create one month, or did you start working at General Assembly uh, right after the first startup that you uh, that you were working at? Well, so the first startup I was working at, my role was to do marketing. I was I was their first marketing coordinator, and I didn't know anything about marketing at the time, but that's where I sort of uh, that's where I started using you know, online education, and, and that's how I learned about guys like General Assembly and Skillshare and U Udemy, because I, you know, I had to learn about this new thing that I knew nothing about at the time. Uh, so I was taking these courses, and I was using these online classes, and, um, and, uh, and it was, it was a pretty crazy ride. I was, like, employee number 15, and they became a 70-person company by the time I left a little over a year later, and uh, I was, like, you know, running a marketing team and managing a budget of like half a million dollars, um, and we won a Guinness Book of World Records, and we did all these other crazy things, working with gigantic brands like McDonald's, Frito Lay. Um, but I, I kind of knew at that point that, you know, I, I actually had a mentor who um, who's one of my teachers originally, and I he kept hearing my pitches about ideas, and at a certain point he just kind of said like, you have to you have to quit and start your own thing. Uh, he didn't really even care what it was. He just wanted to, to like, to fund me to do it. And what was the what was the first thing? Well, the first thing was um, it was like a dynamic pricing system, based a lot on uh, on like this this concept that Tim Ferriss comes up with about, you know, he he really puts forward the idea of building MVPs before they were called MVPs. Yeah. So the idea was you put a your product out there that you're not even like sure you're gonna sell yet, but you see if people are willing to buy it. And um, and you can do this, and you can actually test the pr the price that people are willing to buy it at. So I wanted to build a tool that would do A/B testing of price for people on the internet, so you could figure out the ideal price that you could get. But I didn't know anything about coding at the time, so uh, that sort of kicked me off on this long journey that that brings me to one month Rails and, and one month and where we are today. Yeah, yeah, and and through that you also started essentially a growth hacking agency, the first one ever. Um, yep. Which is Grow Hack, and yep. you also have a different side of Growth Hack, which uh, is very interesting, which is the online education side of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's... you're you're a little bit more focused on, I would say, one month and the education side of Growth Hack, while your partner Conrad is more the the consulting and services side, right? Yeah. Yeah. Although he's uh, you know he's really exploring the education thing now, as well, mostly because it's um, you know it's a it's a Better way to make money while you're sleeping, sort of thing. I mean, consulting is consulting Services is fun. Services don't scale. That's yeah. right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's fun, but um, 
but you have to deal with like client expectations all the time, and you have to, and basically you have to be working constantly. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely. Uh, you know, I, I I do the same thing. I have kind of a, a service side on on a lot, and we actually do a lot of education based uh, courses and things like that as well. And you know, the services side is fun, but you you know you really can't. You're always going to have that bottleneck of, of essentially people. You know, there's always things and disruptive conversations that you have to have, and it you know it puts you at the bottleneck when serve um, courses and so SaaS and things like that. They're, yep. they're easy to scale. So yep. in in GrowHack, are you guys uh, focused specifically on SaaS um, as far as clients? No, not necessarily. I mean, it really started out because we we were just helping our friends launch products or deal with with you know other user related problems like reducing churn or um, increasing conversion on like a sign up flow or th through the onboarding process. Um, it, it actually was originally more um, B2C focused, hmm. but we ended up having a good mix of people in, in classes and, and, um, and who reached out to us who were wondering if we could do this for B2B as well. And Conrad's background is, is enterprise, so it kind of it fit nicely to have him cover some of the SaaS stuff and some of the B2B stuff and, and to have me focusing more on, on you know, direct to consumer. Nice. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your, um, what, what do you define as growth hacking? Because sure. I, th I feel like right now it's, it's almost a little, you know, ev everybody who is a marketer or everybody who codes and knows a little bit about marketing, there are, everyone's basically a growth hacker, but truly I don't, think he, I don't think really too many people still are, you know? Right. I mean, I think, so I think what most people think of as marketing traditionally falls into the, the acquisition stage of growth hacking. But there's four there's four other parts of growth hacking, which include activation, retention, referral, and revenue. Um, you know, acquisition is figuring out how to get people to come to your website, right? Which may involve the more traditional marketing channels like, uh, you know, like Facebook advertising or Google advertising or social media or all of that stuff. And if you do that well, that stage, yeah, sure, it looks like regular marketing, right? But that's often not the most important thing that you know a growth hacker even has to worry about. Um, they may be more concerned with the quality of traffic and how it actually translates into active usage, right? Are you more likely to get uh, like active users from TechCrunch or from Lifehacker, and um, and like the different ways that you can funnel people through so that they become, you know, they sign up for your newsletter so that you can do the the drip campaigns to them to actually get them to sign up and become users, and how do you get them to come back? And a lot of it starts to become product focused really quickly, which is a, a, an area that most marketers are not really very comfortable with. So, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, we wanna, we're trying to hire a growth hacker here because we don't have the bandwidth to do it all ourselves. We wouldn't hire a traditional marketer because they don't have the skill set that we need. And I think that, honestly, most startups need. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you look at companies like Facebook or Twitter or Spotify or, or the, these new startups that are starting to grow to huge sizes. Uh, it used to be that big companies had specialized departments of like marketing and operations and engineering and you know product and all these different areas. Um, now we're starting to see that they're creating teams like cross-functional teams around the different stages of the customer lifecycle. So you have like your acquisition team, which consists of maybe a marketer, but also an engineer and an operations person. And you have your, you know, your activation team, and, and that's also potentially a marketer, an operations person, an engineer. So that's kind of how it scales, but it's it's very clearly cross-functional. Yeah, yeah. I, I think also, um, you know, it, it's 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 about building growth teams because you need someone also even in in biz dev to go out and create strategic relationships to maybe integrate your product and different things like that. You need you need the marketer, you need the coder, you need the guy that kind of knows everything as well. So it's kind of being a generalist at the, the leader of a growth team, I think, or tends to be a generalist who kind of gets the concepts. And says, yeah. All right, this is this is what we need. This is everyone else's role and you have to know like the system on how to on how to implement that, right? Yeah, totally. I mean you need to know enough about say like Google advertising to know like what to do. Right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or where to start if, if that's where the potential lies for you. But um, I mean, I think the core is really an understanding of the process of, of the customer lifecycle and how to measure it and how to run tests effectively. Yeah.
Yeah. <clears throat> you guys, you guys said you were looking for a uh, growth hacker. What are you guys looking for? Because I mean, obviously, a lot of people would probably love to work for you guys. So, what is it that you guys are actually looking for? What characteristics would be in your ideal, you know, hire for that? Um, we need someone that's really like metrics driven, that could look at a number like, um, you know, the engagement rate, and can then come up with five to ten tests that they can then like create themselves and run to see if we can improve that engagement rate, right? Um, you need to be able to tackle everything from getting more people to your site to getting more of them to sign up to getting more of them to become active, getting more of them to recommend their friends, that kind of thing. So, you know, you need to also have, like, the technical understanding to be able to run your own A-B test or to be able to put your own tracking code into place. Um, it's really kind of a rare breed, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's why it's not so easy to find somebody who's good at it, and that's why also most startups don't succeed, right? Like, if you have a, if you're a startup and you have a, a product that has really any kind of value or, or has, like, a big enough market, a good growth hacker will, you know, be the success or the failure of your company, right? You have guys like Noah Kagan or Dave McClure who have like just been able to consistently, successfully build out good products, right? And and, and get them to the to the market by just by just hustling and just by being clever. Yeah. So that, that kind of leads me to ask, what what do you see startups um, that you're consulting with, or really just in the space in general, kind of doing wrong? Uh, the biggest problem is just focusing on trying to get more users to their website. Um, that's the biggest problem that most people think they have, but it's actually not like most people's biggest problem at all. Um, and the, the biggest way of checking this is like whenever someone asks me how they get more traffic to their website, I ask them how much traffic they're currently getting to their website, and most of them don't know, <laughs> right? And so like, how can you know you need more traffic if you don't know what you're currently getting? Uh, then you ask, well, what's your conversion rate currently? Right. If you're getting 100 people to your site every day, what percentage of those guys are converting to, to users? Right. And, and if, they, if they don't know that and if they haven't really, like, really maxed that out, I mean, if you have like 1% of people coming to your site signing up, you can get twice as many users just by doubling that. Right. And in most cases, that's, uh, in most cases they're pretty low-hanging fruit there in terms of what you can optimize to, to double your conversion rate. Especially if yeah. you're a free, a free product. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people are so focused on just getting users, getting users, getting users, but no one's actually focused on essentially the back end of the funnel, which is how, how do we monetize these people? You know, yeah. it's great to get. I, I got a million users. Awesome. Well, how much? How much are you making from the users? Who's paying what? Oh, well, that that's not important. Yeah, it is. That's super <laughs> important because that that's how you're gonna stay afloat. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. The other thing I would say is that people aren't measuring nearly enough, um, yeah. and we see we do end up seeing a lot of resistance to putting like measurements and, and metrics and stuff in place because people feel like it's uh, it just kind of slows down the whole process, right? But at the end of the day, if if you don't actually if you don't know what your what your numbers are currently and you like and you have no way of measuring what they will be in the future, you don't know if what you're doing is working or not. Right, you you're sort of just running around like a chicken with his head cut off. What do you, um What do you suggest are some key things to measure? Um, I would say pick one one important thing that you want to measure in each of the of the five stages of the funnel. Um, don't focus on too much more because it can be overwhelming initially. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the the obvious ones are just the traffic coming to your website, so the total number of people. Um, the conversion rate of, of percentage of people who come to your website that sign up, your uh, that's pretty clear. Your engagement rate is going to be a little bit more ambiguous, but that's like what what percentage of your users are active users at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, you know that some people measure that in terms of they have signed in, in the last 30 days. For some people, it's uh, it's in the last week or the last three days. So that'll really depend on what kind of product you have. Um, it's you know how many of them have actually given you any money or contributed to like the bottom line at all, um, and then later it's you know can you track referral? Can you see how many of them have recommended this product to a friend? But that's really not that important early on. Yeah, that that's more kind of working towards an onboarding process and you know measuring how that's working for you. You will. I mean, you can 
people talk about virality a lot, right? And if you can if you can optimize the system that you use to to incentivize people to invite their friends, mm -hmm. that can I mean, that can be pretty significant eventually, right? Like in the early days of Dropbox, about thirty percent of their users were coming in through referrals, and so that that wasn't enough to make them viral, but it was enough that you know if they paid a dollar to bring in a new customer, the cost of that customer was actually just seventy cents, right? Because they were getting an extra thirty percent of people for free, mm -hmm. and so that that can make you actually compete pretty effectively as a startup against someone else who's spending has to spend a ton of money and and you know hasn't figured out virality. How much of a <clears throat> how much of growth hacking and, and and all this do you think is innovation and just testing? And how much of it do you think is is operations and just systems to to manage and maintain growth? You know, because growth hacking is great, but how do we maintain that growth? We don't we don't want it to to kind of just go like this, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think there's I think there's two aspects of it, and the guys who do it really well are the guys who are truly innovating, and that's where the term like growth hacker really comes from. You know, it's the guys who are concerned about the objective, and and they come up with all these clever ways of getting there. Um, you know, the, the the example that kind of made the term famous was when um, when Airbnb figured out the, this hacked Craigslist integration where they could post, you know, they could help users post their Airbnb listings directly on Craigslist without using an API or without actually, like, needing Craigslist involvement at all, right? And that's a, that's a really clever approach. And, like, in the early days of, of social games, for example, they thrived on the Facebook platform and they figured out all of these clever, innovative ways to get users to share these things with their friends. Um, nowadays, a lot of that stuff you know, has been tested, and, and we know that there are certain best practices. So when you're first coming in, you know, all you're doing really is just setting the best practices in place, making sure that the, you know, the copy is optimized and making sure you're testing the, the right things. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're only doing that, then you're, you're kind of going to be constantly behind or constantly trying to catch up. So, you know, there there is a level of innovation that really has to happen in order for you to, to like truly stand out as a startup. Yeah. So it's uh let's go back to growth hack grow hack for a little bit. Sure. And uh, talk talk a little bit about the courses. Um I noticed that you guys are focusing on some some very strong metric driven kind of courses. Where do you where do you guys see um what you guys are working on? I, I know that on full start, I believe, you just wrote an article on online marketing in the future, or online education-based courses are going to be, you know, the future. And I, yes. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Like I said, we're we're building out a lot of similar things. Um, where totally. do you see this? Where do you see this going as far as education for for businesses, for startups, really for everyone? Um, I mean, we're really going in the direction of creating content to make some of these things easier. That like, there's no resources around. So like. The, even a small aspect of, of what I talk about when I talk about growth hacking is analytics, for example, and yet we find that a lot of people have trouble, like they, they don't know how to set up Mixpanel, right? And it's it's not that surprising because there's very little documentation out there about how to set this thing up, and yet it tends to be almost exactly the same at every company you go to. So a lot of that, like the metrics-based stuff there is is based on the demand and what we've heard that people actually want to learn how to do. Um, they want to learn how to use these tools, and and uh, and to it's it's also what makes them kind of the most powerful in the shortest amount of time, which is our focus. Um, and then they can explore on their own, but hopefully they'll have the language that they can use to explore on their own. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the future of education is is a really fascinating area, though. Like, um, I think that I think that in the future everyone's going to be like constantly learning. Um, there's no reason to become stagnant and to sort of just become comfortable with your skill set. And in fact, when you do, it becomes kind of boring. Like I don't know if you've ever had a job where it was challenging, and then you just get used to it, and then you know it never continues to challenge you, and then you kind of, you know, you start looking around for other stuff. Um, and so I, you know, with a lot of this, these courses, we kind of feel like this is something that people may continue studying for the rest of their life to make like the skills that they're constantly using a, a little bit better. Yeah, I, I definitely think that, in, in, at least in this industry, you know, people are always trying to learn and always trying to grow. So, um, yeah. what's your focus? Uh, speaking of that, with with one month, where where, you, where do you plan on taking uh, one month? Um, I mean, really in a very similar direction. With one month, it's uh, 
With one month, it's about like how can we take how can we take a complicated topic and boil it down into the easiest uh, onboarding process for anybody. Like the 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 best and and most motivational and most powerful 30 days that you could come up with. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's learning about how to code, or it's learning about uh, how to write a book, or you know how to get into meditation, any of these things that like you've always wanted to explore, but you really have no idea where to start. Um, you know, maybe you you search for books on Amazon, or you like ask your friend or whatever, and, and they come up with a list of stuff for you. But for most people. You know, they've. It's just something they've like thought about, and they've been wanting to do forever, and they have never actually like jumped in. That's kind of what we saw with the with the coding stuff, right? Yeah. People just don't really know where to start, and they and they want to have a path, and they want to they want to know exactly what they're going to get out of it, and how much time they're going to spend doing it. Yeah. Are you are you planning on kind of ex expanding one month to to a full brand, and like you said, just doing like learn one month how to meditate and learning things in one month kind of yeah absolutely I mean we're in the process of doing a pretty cool like a uh, uh, brand redesign so we'll be excited to launch that pretty soon um, and the idea is to bring it into this realm of like you know kind of what the four dummies brand did for uh, for publishing okay like golf for dummies and poker for dummies and all these things except that you know who wants to read a book anymore yeah, yeah, dummies for 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 younger, yeah, the, the younger generation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I I wouldn't say necessarily that we're focused just on younger people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm just with uh without the reading, you know what I mean? Because it it is people don't read that much anymore. And if you do, you're reading your Kindle, which is you know. Totally. I I would say maybe dummies for the lazy generation, <laughs> or for the or for the busy generation, or or like whatever we are, right? Because yeah. we. We kind of all are. I haven't read a book in, in like years. I just listen to audiobooks. It's funny though, because you consume more content and you're you're always learning, but you're not necessarily reading a book. You know, I'm, I'm sure. always I'm always on the podcast. channel has always, changed. Yeah. The medium has changed. That's exactly right. Yeah. Did you guys go with uh, one month specifically? Obviously, it sounds nice and rolls off the tongue, but did some of that play into the power of habits and kind of creating mm -hmm. that habit within 30 days? Yeah, totally. And we looked a lot at. Um, at like the the workout space of the workout industry, where they people sell like P90X, which is like a, a like a one month program. Every day you, it's like 30 minutes a day, and it's uh, it's something that's obviously works because they keep running with that formula, and like people like to be able to see a before and after picture, and they know exactly how much time it's going to take. Um, and so we thought, why not like apply this model that works to uh, to a new area where it hasn't been tested yet. And you know it worked out there, so it's just a matter of like pushing with that forward until we we reach the limits of what that allows. When it comes to your customers, I mean, so after that one month, are they basically done with you, or is there any any ongoing? You know, is it you only have a customer for that one month? Is I mean, there any upsells or anything like that afterwards? For the time being, that's it. Um, yeah. You know, we have a lot of we have a lot of students who. Who like we stay in touch with for, for months and months, and a lot of people come back and use it as a resource, or um, or they help out other students there. But um, but that's really where the role of, of like building out a curriculum comes in. I mean, it's not like a it's not like a SaaS product where once you get a user, like ideally they'd be using it forever, right? Uh, you kind of want to bring people through it, which is uh, which is cool, but it, it also poses a unique set of challenges, as you mentioned. <laughs> Yeah, because now you actually do have to worry about always bringing in new people, and and that's exactly. where the. But the the good side of that is if people are actually going through it, it's going to be a lot more easy to get them to refer other people and you know post about it and talk about it. That's right, or to take the next class, right? Because if they if they trust you and they like the way that you're teaching, then they're going to want to consume more of the content. Exactly. So what what are some of the things? Um, you guys, and I, you don't have to say specifically, but what what are some of the things you guys are doing to essentially try to uh, hack or or get some growth with uh, with one month? Um, we're we're focusing a lot on on this this area of like between free and paid education. Um, you know, I think that we can put a lot of free content out there that's very useful to people, mm -hmm. and and funnel that towards the paid stuff. Uh, for example, installrails.com was a site that we built 
as a resource for you know installing Ruby on Rails because it was a problem that a lot of people had, and in fact it's a problem people have in our class. So we built that not only as a way to you know to improve the onboarding so to speak of our class um, and make sure less people get stuck at the installation part, but it's also you know a place that people uh, that other guides are linking to, right, and and that funnels users back towards our site. So there's stuff like that. There's stuff like Hacker News Nation, which is like this weekly web TV show that we do about Hacker News, and yeah. and it's starting to build up a following, and that that comes into you know one month Rails and and other courses we're doing. Um, I mean, I think the in the the biggest potential for us to grow in the future is to release different classes in different verticals and and target different markets, and then basically you build up a, a like a, a relationship with these people, and um, and then you know convince them that they want to learn a different topic that maybe they had never thought about learning. Yeah. How important do you think, with, with that said, um, email marketing is? Oh, uh, it's with, incredibly important. I think email marketing is one of the most underrated uh, you know, forms of marketing or, or tools for startups in general, um, you know, like for engagement, for, for getting people getting people to share with friends, for just even having them interact with your products. A lot of products just work exclusively through email. Yeah, it's it's surprising how people don't va- you know, they don't they don't value email as much as as before and and I get it cuz there's there's all these different mediums and things like that where essentially you're almost getting an email, but people still live and die through email marketing companies still still live and die through through email marketing and I I think that that's a channel that um, not enough startups are taking advantage of and and even uh, you know, speaking about that, kind of like upselling inside their emails and selling yeah. more different offers and things like that. I, I was talking to someone who has uh, 11,000 paying subscribers that are paying them uh, 35 bucks a month, and they don't... Oh, I think he... Well, continue with the story. We'll, well see if we yeah, can uh, yeah. grab him back. So, I think he is... Hold on one second. And he is back. <laughs> I lost right. you guys. <laughs> that was a quick one. But yeah, gotta so, keep it interesting. So they, I know, so they have on the edge of your seat. Eleven thousand paying subscribers. Yeah, so they have eleven thousand paying subscribers, and they've never sent them an email saying, "Hey, what about over here? This other thing that's another five bucks a month, or another just five dollars one-time payment, or anything like that." They've never. They're like, "Oh no, we already got them. They're they're already a they're already a buyer. They're already a subscriber. We we can't sell them anything anymore." Talk to me sure. about what you think about that, because I think a lot of startups are afraid to ask for money. <laughs> well, I think um, I mean I think it's all about you know this relationship with people and and it's a give and a take, um, but you have to keep the relationship active, right? And and it's 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 very easy to just sort of like sit back and and say I have an email list of let's say like ten thousand people, uh, but I don't want to I don't want to send too much stuff to them, but as a result of that they kind of they forget who you are anyway, and and so it, it becomes useless, right? I mean you need to keep people engaged. You need to be Communicating with them often, and um, I mean the people who really do it well, though, are able to bring value to their customers and bring them these these yeah. offers, these deals, these products that they actually want to buy, right? Yeah. I mean, um, like these people are fine paying for this stuff, right? In fact, they'll they often want to do it because they like the person and they want to support what the guy does, and and uh, and because the person has given them so much. Right, um, you can't feel embarrassed about charging money for a product because, you know, that kind of assumes this mentality. Like you feel like you're taking advantage of people. Yeah, yeah, and and with email, you build the relationship. You're essentially serving them. They're telling you what else they want. I mean, I I, I definitely think that it's a it's it's an underrated tool. Yeah. So so what tools are are you guys using right now? I mean, our our basic we use Segment IO for like putting all of our uh, all of our like analytics and tracking stuff in place inside Segment IO. Um, we use it to set up Mixpanel and Customer IO for for the drip email stuff. Uh, let me take a look here. Um, we're we've been really big on Intercom IO recently because I, I'm a huge fan of like the interface that it has and how you can get have these conversations with users uh, while they're on your site and inside your site. Uh, we're using AdRoll for retargeting, Olark for live chat, Qualaroo for surveying, Optimizely for A-B testing. Uh, what else do we have going on? 
I think those are the big ones. Yeah, it, it's crazy how good of tools there are now that you don't have to, you know, kind of create things in house. You know what I mean? Totally. Totally. Uh, we we're using Strikingly for for creating like beautiful landing pages really quickly. Strikingly. Um, strikingly. Okay. Hmm. Never heard uh, of it. That's this. We we use them to set up our jobs page, um, and it, it's gorgeous. And it's like a just a a perfect mobile optimized landing page. Nice. That gonna gonna have to check them out. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, I mean, well, um, we're kind of we're kind of almost at the end of the road. So any uh, anything you want to kind of leave us with, or <laughs> any anything in 2014 that you're doing that you weren't doing last year that has been big for you? What's anything new? Um, yeah, I mean, we're exploring a lot of paid advertising now, which is definitely fun. <laughs> um, We'll see how well and how effectively that works out. No, I mean, I think I think we're we're constantly focusing on uh, like the future of education and and like how we're going to transform how people teach, uh, how people create content, the ways that students interact with teachers online. Um, so we're excited to be you know rolling out our new classes. Our next class is one month HTML, which should be out in the next month or so, and that's kind of like. Um, you know, like you mentioned, Dan, it's like the the upsell, right, or the follow-on to One Month Rails, or maybe even the precursor, depending on who you are. Yeah. Um, so excited to have that be out, and um, and we've we've just got a few cool announcements in the pipeline. So probably the next like three months or so, some of those should be out there. Nice, nice. Well, if people want to connect with you and uh and and reach out or or anything like that, any any sites you want to drive them to specifically? Um, yeah, I mean, we'll just find me on Twitter, Matan Griffel. I'm pretty reachable. I like respond to just about everything. Um, we are hiring, so jobs.onemonth.com, and uh, and just my website, matangriffel.com. You'll see, you know, the stuff that I'm working on there. You'll be able to, you know, email me through that and uh, and you know, have fun doing the stuff. I have a few resources, you know, in case people have questions about the stuff. They want to send questions my way. Cool, man. Well, this has been this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Cool. And, uh, we appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Cool. It was great talking uh, to you, too. Have a good one, man. Bye, Dan.